In the previous video, we saw that the four momentum transforms in the same way as space-time coordinates transform, according to the Lorentz transformations. So that means if you have space-time coordinates for an event in one reference frame, you follow a procedure, the Lorentz transformations, and figure out what those coordinates will look like in another reference frame. Similarly, if you have the momentum of an object at a particular time in one reference frame, you can transform that to figure out what that looks like in another reference frame by following the Lorentz transformations. It's the same transformation. So that leads us to wonder, um, is there more, can, uh, can we sort of go further with this similarity between momentum and space-time coordinates? Since they transform in the same way, maybe they have some similar mathematical properties. So that'll be our starting point for this video, where we'll, we'll um, explore another important property of four momentum. So um, for think when we think about space-time coordinates, we know that there's a certain quantity that's the same for all observers. It's an invariant. It doesn't change from reference frame to reference frame. And that's the space-time interval, delta t squared minus delta x squared. So um, we can think about defining this as the um, uh, time read by a clock, inertial clock that's present at two events. We can also um, use algebra to show that just if you take this quantity and you apply the Lorentz transformation to it, you'll end up where you started. You'll get the same thing. So I wonder, is there a similar invariant for P, something that's the same for all observers? Um, and the answer is yes. And um, perhaps unsurprisingly, it has the same mathematical form. Unsurprising because really P and the, the P vector and our space and coordinate vectors, they transform in the same way. All right, so, um, all right, so the answer to this question is going to be yes. And the quantity that I want to focus on is this. So this quantity, it says take the t component of momentum squared and subtract from that the x component of the momentum squared. Very, very similar to this. So let's do a little bit of math on this. And um, we'll see that this is indeed invariant. And we'll see what that invariant quantity turns out to be. It'll, and it'll have a clear physical meaning. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do, and this will be a couple steps of algebra, but nothing crazy, is I'm going to plug in expressions for PT and PX. PT and uh, PX. So DT, D tau, DX, D tau. So let's do that. So M, DT, D tau squared minus M, DX, D tau. Squared. All right. So now let's do um, let's do a little bit of algebra. There's going to be an m squared term, right? So when I square this out, I have to square the m and I have to square the dt d tau. I want to have an m squared blah minus m squared blah de blah. So there's an m squared in both terms. So um, and then there's going to be a, a d tau in both terms. So you know, I rather than just say all that. I'm just going to write this. I thought saying it would save time, but I don't think it does. Okay, so I'm just squaring everything in the parentheses. And then I say, hey, there's an m squared in both terms. Oh, and there's a d tau squared in both terms. So let's factor that out. Okay, so m squared d tau squared, and this is going to give me dt squared, minus dx squared. Hey, you know what? That is just the space-time interval. That's the definition of the space-time interval. So, d tau squared. And I'm writing um, a lowercase d here, because the picture is, is that we're considering a very, very small interval, right? The context is we've got an object moving through space-time, and we're considering two events along that world line that are very close together. So since these events are close together, 
the space-time interval is also the proper time. So let's think about that. All right, so a space-time interval has to be for an inertial clock, an inertial clock present at two events. In general, like if I went from here to here, the clock associated with this object would not measure the space-time interval because that's not an inertial clock. It's not moving at a constant speed. But if I zoom in on a tiny little region of this, that curve right, starts to look straighter and straighter and straighter. And so um, for a very small step along this curve, the clock is essentially inertial, and therefore the um, uh, space-time interval is indeed um, a proper time. So, in any event, the main, um, uh, what, what am I trying to say? I should again write maybe instead of speaking. The space-time interval is a proper time. And so now look what happened. I've got proper time squared over proper time squared. Hmm. Well, this simplified down to almost nothing. m squared. So m squared is this minus that. And let me just take the square root of both sides and write this like so. Okay, so there is indeed an invariant for the uh, momentum, something that all observers will agree on, and that's the mass. The mass of an object is um, invariant. All observers will see the same thing for it. Um, it um, is, in a sense, deeply real. It's not something that's observer-dependent. Right? And we said the same thing, this idea of like something deeply physical or real about the space-time interval. It's like the distance between two points. Um, I could arrange the grid on a map in lots of different ways. I could choose even different units. But the distance between two points is something that's physical. It's not dependent upon any convention of what we choose to be the origin or how we orient north and south. Um, similarly, here the mass is something that's deeply real. It's not, um, it doesn't depend on the reference frame in which we observe the object. So this is um, the other key property of form momentum and special relativity that um, I wanted to mention. In the next video, we'll look and we'll see that form momentum is indeed conserved in special relativity.